The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. American democracy undertakes one of its most sacred rituals tomorrow, the swearing in of a new president. But amidst the division and even violence of this past election cycle, can the United States find a way to come together? We'll hear why renowned American political scientist Robert Putnam argues that history says they can. Then, as TVO launches season three of our series Political Blind Date, we'll preview tonight's topic, the problem of hallway health care, now only made more difficult by COVID-19. It's Tuesday, January 19th, and that's next on The Agenda. Tomorrow, the United States of America will swear in its 46th president. But as the storming of the Capitol building two weeks ago and the unprecedented security apparatus in place for the inauguration demonstrate, there's deep polarization there and divides that cannot be papered over. But as unprecedented as people say, perhaps not, according to a new book by preeminent American political scientist Robert Putnam and writer and social entrepreneur Shailen Romney Garrett. It's called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. And we're pleased that it brings to our airwaves in St. George, Utah, Shailen Romney Garrett, and in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, Robert Putnam, the Malkin Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. And it's great to have you two on our airwaves tonight. Mr. Putnam, I am going to do what my mother would no doubt be outraged by, and that is follow your advice and call you Bob as you have insisted. Difficult, but I'm going to try. Um, let's start with this. I know this news is two weeks old already, but I can tell you um, I've spoken to so many Canadians who were absolutely shocked by what they saw on the Capitol um, a couple of weeks ago on January the 6th. Maybe not surprised, but shocked. Um, can I start there? What was your reaction, Bob, to what you saw on the 6th of January? Well, of course, it was unprecedented and, and shocking. I mean, it, it, at some level, it doesn't seem to be believable um, because it represents um, the culmination of this intense tribalism. And, um, and of course, in the, it, it's no doubt that Trump himself is responsible for a lot of this, along with the... The, uh, the people who violently attacked the, the Congress. Um, it's, in the short run, of course, it's about Trump. But um, it's important to keep in mind that this polarization of American politics did not begin when Trump entered the White House, and it won't end when Trump leaves the White House. This is, in part, important part, a reflection of much longer trends in American society. Indeed. And I'm, actually, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not deeply pessimistic. Um, I am. It's not going to turn on in the short run. But I think in the, the Biden administration is going to come in with more opportunities for making deals on policy issues than I think is widely understood. But it's no doubt we're really polarized. Shailen, how about you? Your reaction when you were watching it unfold? Yeah, so I live in southern Utah, one of the reddest parts of a red state, and so I'm surrounded by people who support Trump. Um, I don't support him, but I see and hear the logic of the people who do. Of course, I'm shocked that it went as far as it did, but at the same time, in a way, this was sort of always the man that was going to push this this far. And so, again, there is that not surprised and yet horrified at the same time. Bob, I was going to ask how it is possible that you, who are, you're in New England right now, which is one of the bluest parts of America, and your co-author is from one of the reddest parts of America, how is it you two get along so well? <laughs> We've been friends um, for a long time. Uh... Indeed, uh, 25 years ago, roughly speaking, Shailen was a student of mine, um, and um, and we've worked together on a variety of books. So we get along really well, um, and and our outlook on a lot of the issues in this book is virtually identical. But 
um, we have the advantage that we're obviously of different generations, we're obviously of different genders, and we obviously live in very different parts of America. So we bring a kind of a stereoscopic uh, view onto this set of problems that America is facing now, and, and as you know, has faced before. So, Shailen, if, if somebody from Utah and somebody from New England can get along, there's hope for everybody. Is that the idea? Absolutely. <laughs> there's absolutely hope for everybody. All right. To that end, then, let's get into the thesis of your book, The Upswing, because you looked at four different aspects of American life, economics, politics, society, and culture. And I have to say, the most fascinating thing about your book is that you measured many, many, many different aspects of those four areas and discovered that when you map that out on a graph, you basically get... I know you call it an inverted U, but I'd call it a mountain. And for those listening on podcasts, I'll just describe this a bit. The graph shows that from the 1880s to, say, 1960, America got essentially increasingly fair with more social cohesion and a sense that the great majority of people thought the country was headed in the right direction. And the line goes up and up and up like the side of a mountain, and it peaks in 1960. And conversely, since the 1960s, the country has been headed down, 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 and you see the side of the mountain coming back down to earth. Bob, when you embarked on this research, did you know that's what you were going to find? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, had, I, I and a lot of other people had written about the, the more recent uh, half century, the, downs, the downswing, so to speak, um, and, um, and I had written a, a book called uh, a Bowling Alone a couple of years ago, well, 20, 25 years ago, which described the, the decline in, in social connections among people. Um, but I didn't know, and I think relatively few people knew, that if you took the curve back all the way to the beginning of the 20th century, you saw this curve. We call it the I-We-I curve because at the beginning of it, uh, in the so-called Gilded Age, uh, America was very self-centered. I, uh, we were unequal. We were politically polarized. We were socially isolated. We were culturally selfish or self-centered. And then we moved, as you said, into the by the uh, time of the sixties, we become just as we were reaching that peak. Then we suddenly turned and began to become less equal, more polarized, more socially disconnected, and more self-centered again. And that's what we mean by the I we I curve. And, and actually, I was shocked by it, by two things. First of all, I was shocked that you could see the same pattern in these four very different areas, economics and society and, and culture and, and politics. But secondly, that they all followed exactly the same pattern. Shailen, I think maybe sure. we should explain to viewers here, because everybody understands how you can me you know, measure economics. You know, incomes go up or down, growth rates go up or down, et cetera. How do you empirically measure social cohesion or toxicity in politics, those kinds of things. Sure. So to start with social cohesion, you measure things like group membership. You measure um, how often people affiliate with a religion and attend church. Um, you measure all sorts of different things that have to do with whether people are joining, whether they're spending their time together or whether they're spending their time apart. Um, and that's, of course, you know, Bob wrote the seminal book on this in Bowling Alone, where he just looked at, you know, scores and scores of measures that really add up to a concept called social capital, the idea that you can measure the connectedness of a society. So that that is very hard data. When it comes to politics, you know, measuring polarization, you might measure things like um, how often Republicans in Congress support the, the bills and legislation presented by Democrats. You might, um, on a more granular level, measure voter behavior. For example, um, how often do, do Americans vote a split ticket, meaning that they might vote for a Republican president, but then down ballot they might vote for some Democrats in local races? That actually used to be very common in mid-century America. Today it's almost unheard of, right? So those are a couple of measures of polarization. You can also measure something called affective polarization. How do people feel about members of the other party? So you can measure sort of warmth or coldness when it, asking a Republican to think about personally how they feel about a Democrat. We don't have that type of survey data going back, you know, for the full 125 years, but we do have that data uh, going back, you know, to roughly mid-century America. So there, there are lots of different ways. And then, of course, one of the most interesting things that we address is culture. 
um, this culture of narcissism versus culture of altruism, which Bob described as that I ethos versus the we ethos. And some of the most interesting data in the book, I think, comes in um, the chapter where we address that. And one of the most interesting data sets that Bob discovered to measure culture was something called M excuse me, n-gram data. So that's data that measures the frequency of different words that have been used in all books published in the English language over time. So Google has actually digitized millions upon millions of books published over a long stretch of time um, in the English language. And you can actually measure the frequency of different words as they appear in those books. And you can measure the different, the relative frequency of the, of the pronoun I versus the pronoun we. And when you track that ratio, shockingly, breathtakingly, it tracks that same inverted U curve over those 125 years. Hmm. Now, Bob, I should follow up with you on this, which is Canada is a much more communica communitarian place, which means yeah. the notion of us being a more we than I society, it doesn't necessarily offend that many people here. But there are plenty of people in America who will say the fact that you were a more we society in 1960 and you're a more I society today that's not necessarily a good thing. How do you respond to that? Well, um, first of all, actually, there's a lot of work in Canada that uh, tracks the same basic uh, issues that we have here. It's absolutely true that Canadian, Canadian Canada is, on average, more communitarian in our, in our language, more a we society. But many of the trends actually are not that different in Canada from the United States. There's been a lot of research on, on that. Um, so, uh, is, so is why is we good? Is is the question you're answering? And it isn't. Um, it's not a perfect. Uh, and we don't say that we're all in favor of an extreme, communitarian kind of place. Indeed, I grew up in the '50s, and I know perfectly well that there were things that were wrong with that society: excessive conformity and so on. And in fact, you know, Tocqueville, who is the patron saint of American communitarians, that is. Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote about America in the 1830s, he's he's always described as he's always uh, cited as an example of the, someone who saw very early on the degree to which Americans were connected with one another and traced a lot of American democracy's strengths to that. But he also invented the word individualism to refer to this other side of American character: the fact that um, we are, in some sense, benefit from. The opposite of community emphasis, the opposite of community, that is on the individual. And he um, basically uh, created or conceived the way of thinking about how to reconcile those two. And he, it's what he called um, self interest rightly understood. That is, if you think you can follow your own self interest, but you need to think about how your self interest over the long run is affected by how well other people in society are doing. So it's, it's not the case that. Um, it's all the community is all good, but clearly I think, and and many Americans think we're way out of balance now. We've got become way too much focused on I, and not enough on we, just as we were, you know, a century, 125 years ago. When again, then you can see it very easily. Now we were w way out of focus in terms of the balance between the individual and the community. Well, let's put the graph up here. I'll <laughs> ask our director, Sheldon Osman, if you would, bottom of page three, Sheldon, the community versus the individualism in America. And they track it from 1890 to basically present day. And once again, there's that mountain shape. And I guess, Shailen, I want to understand what's going on at the dawn of the 1960s in your country that made so many Americans feel we're in this together as opposed to I'm in it for myself. Well, I think it's less a question of what was happening at the dawn of the 1960s and more what was happening in the Gilded Age. I mean, because the 60s was really a culmination of a trend that was building over the course of 60 to 70 years, right? And so it's you can't just look at that mid-century America and go, oh, what was special about that? without understanding what was special about the six decades that preceded it, right? And so I think it's really important to note that America, by hard measures, not just from a historical, you know, sort of circumstantial perspective, but by hard measures, was in a very similar place to where we are today back in the 1890s, during the last Gilded Age. Extremely, you know, we had, back then we had unprecedented prosperity, economic opportunity, and personal freedom, 
but they came with extreme inequality, a zero sum power struggle in, in politics and um, extreme hyper individualism in our culture and a very lonely, isolated populace. And so then we turned the corner. A, a, de a determined group of reformers decided that this was not true to the full range of American values. And they began to turn us to pivot the nation away from that I ethos and back towards we. So what we see in the 1960s is really a culmination of those six decades of turning it around. Well, uh, we're a day in front of the inauguration of a new American president who's going to give his inaugural address. And, you know, the guy who, the guy who's interested in John F. Kennedy, as I am, would think 60 years ago there was a guy saying, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Bob, is that the culmination then, those lines in some respects of what Shalem was just talking about? Yep. Uh, ironically, Steve, I was there personally. I was a college student at the time, and my um, then girlfriend, now wife of 60 years, or nearly 60 years, we were standing there, and 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 I heard him say those very words. And actually, I'm you know I'm 80 now, and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up because that was such an inspirational moment. It seemed like a reveille for a new age in America. But what we can see now, looking back historically, is that he was speaking at the very peak of this sense of community. And it was not Reveille, it was Taps, uh, historically. And it's very distressing, um, and we've got a long way to go before we can get back to that. I mean, I have great hopes for, uh, for Biden, actually, and I think his inaugural address, it's not gonna be as, as uh, oratorically great as, as Kennedy's was, but I have great hope for him but it'll be a long time. It won't be six months or even six years. It'll be 20 or 30 years before we can really get back to a more balanced position between the individual and, and the community. Couldn't be as good. He hasn't got Ted Sorensen writing a speech for him, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a quote from your book here. The United States in the 1870s, the 1880s, and the 1890s was startlingly similar to today. Inequality, political polarization, social dislocation, and cultural narcissism prevailed all accompanied, as they are now, by unprecedented technological advances, prosperity, and material well-being. The parallels are indeed so striking that the foregoing description could have been written virtually word for word about our nation today. Looking back to a time Mark Twain disparagingly called the Gilded Age turns out to feel eerily like looking in the mirror. Uh, Shailen, pick up on that if you would. How did you measure the fact that today so many people seem to be out for themselves? Well, we've talked a little bit about the statistical measures, but I think what was so striking for me, you know, part of my job on this book was to look back at the historical record and go, okay, if we understand that statistically we were in the same place, what did that look like sort of in the lived experience of Americans? And it was really shocking, actually, to find the parallels. That passage that you read comes at the end of an, I don't know, 15-page um, introduction in which we really detail in very granular um, fashion what America looked like. I mean, there was an extreme extreme inequality and class segregation. Um, the economy was ruled by corporate monopolies. Workers were powerless to negotiate for themselves. Pollution was choking air and waterways. We had contaminated products in the marketplace. And then in politics, we were extremely polarized. Populism and socialism were becoming, you know, attractive alternatives to the main two-party system. And there was a lot of cynicism about a rigged system. Does that sound familiar? I think uh, so. We also, you know, had extreme loneliness, disillusionment, and despair that manifested as you know, consumerism, materialism, widespread drug and alcohol use, a sort of fevered pace of life, um, as well as, you know, commentators foretelling disaster, saying this is the end of the American experiment, democracy has failed, and we, you know, this is the end. But what's amazing was that none of those sort of doomsday prophecies turned out to be true. On the contrary, America entered a pivot that ushered in a 60 to 70 year upswing that took us to unprecedented heights of altruism, community, political comedy, and economic equality. It's really a breathtaking story. In which case, Bob, pick up on the story if you would. Who, or I was gonna say what, but perhaps more accurately, who gets credit for ushering in that new era? Yeah, it's a very interesting story, I think, um, uh, Steve. We, um, 
it's it's called the Progressive Era in American historiography. It's the period, roughly speaking, from 1900 to 1915, 1920. Um, and there were a determined band of people who were much more um, who were unhappy with with what we've just described, unhappy with the inequality and the polarization and the self-centeredness and so on. Um, and in the book, we try to pull out what are the lessons from that period that we can learn. For example, they were mostly young. Um, the, the people, for example, Jane Addams, who famously founded the Hull House, the first settlement house in America, we think of her uh, when she's, pictures of her when she's 70 or 80 and getting the Nobel Prize. But in fact, when she did the work, the important work, she was in her 20s. And that's true across the board. That these people were young people. And that we think that is directly relevant to America today. That is to say, and we think it's not going to be people my age. Uh, it's going to be these younger folks like Greta Toon and the, and the kids from the, the high school in the, where the shooting took place in Florida and so on. Um, secondly, it was a very decentralized movement. It, that the innovations that are really important came not from Washington and not from Harvard. They came from small towns in the middle of America. And we think, again, that's relevant today. We think uh, we're, we're ripe for a period of experimentation, what one of the progressives called the laboratories of democracy at the state and local level where people can try out different ideas and, and some of them will be great and some of them won't. We think finally that another important lesson of that period that's relevant today is uh, it wasn't the economics, the economic variables that led this crisis. We can look in detail actually to see, well, which is going first? What's the leading variable here? And it's not economics. Economics if it is, if anything, a lagging variable. It looks to us as though it's actually culture or morality. And I know that sounds a little, to some social scientists, it sounds a little, I don't know, airy-fairy. But um, it looks to us as though the crucial part of that turning then was that these people turned a hard eye on their own morality, because many of them were from the, the well-off sides, the well-off parts of society, and said, is this the kind of society that we want to live in? And I think myself, and I, well, Shay Lane and I both think, that an early indicator of whether we're going to be moving in that direction now will be whether we begin to think about our moral obligations to one another. And I'm hoping, of course, if you don't, you're not careful, this sounds a little, uh, you know, moralizing and sermon, sermonizing and so on. But I'm hoping that Biden will also call us to our better angels and get us to think one another about what we actually do owe one another in in moral and and um, and social terms. Before we think of those better angels of tomorrow, though, I want to find out where they were 100 years ago, because in the midst of that progressive era, Shay Lin, uh, we had a resurgence of apartheid, let's call it that. It's the Jim Crow situation, basically, in the Deep South. And mm -hmm. how do you reconcile that sort of move up the mountain towards greater social cohesion with, at the same time, that kind of appallingly racist resurgence? Sure. I mean, when we look at this period, there are a lot of positive lessons that we can draw from it. And those are the ones that Bob was outlining. And there are others. But there are also some cautionary tales, the biggest of which is what you bring up, which is that many of these progressives that we are lauding as having sort of turned America back toward we were themselves racist. And so their circle of moral concern did not extend far enough um, at all. And, and in some sense, that meant that this that the sort of this upswing that they ushered in had knit into it the seeds of its own demise, right? They sort of kicked the can down the road on dealing with the racial um, the racial issues in this country. And as a result, you know, one of the things that we identify as having tipped the curve back in the other direction, away from we and toward I, is a white backlash against the civil rights movement. So the civil rights movement happened at the peak of this weeness when we sort of had um, this fragile national consensus about widening the we and we were able to achieve that through landmark legislation. But immediately on the heels of that, white Americans began to sort of circle the wagons and say, not in my backyard. And that's because we never did the work of true racial reconciliation, which again, 
that's about morality. That's heart work that Americans need to do. And we know that any upswing that we would hope to see today has to have full inclusion at the absolute heart of it and also has to be something in which we are willing to engage in real relationship again. There is no we without real relationship and there is no real relationship without honesty and trust. And when it comes to race, in America, we've not had honesty, we've not had trust. This is what the Black Lives Matter movement is calling for today, is for us to really look that history and the current situation in the face and say, what's it gonna take for us to be a we? Hmm. These are the unhappiest words I'm going to say today because I'm enjoying this so much, but we are literally down to our last few minutes. And I've learned over the years, you never should bet against America because America has an amazing ability to redefine itself and and uh, what was Churchill's line? After basically exhausting every other option, it does the right thing eventually. But, but oh my goodness, Bob, it seems so bleak right now. It just seems, how, how do you see this, uh, other than history repeating itself and the, and the arc going back up to form the next set of mountain ranges, how do you see this happening? Well, you know, um, we, we are skeptical, <clears throat> pardon me, of the metaphor of a pendulum that kind of swings back and forth, um, moved by whatever, the tides of history. And we, looking carefully at this earlier episode, the, the turning point in the, uh, from the Gilded Age to the Progressive Era around 1900, what we see is that this was not um, determined by some kind of immutable logic that, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna turn around. These were people this was what, in the in the jargon of, of uh, it's a little new agey jargon, there's an agency there. By that, I mean, they made it happen. It wasn't inevitable it was gonna happen. And if there's any lesson that we learned from this whole story, and in a way, it's the most important story, and we wanna convey this to, to young people, it is that you're not the victim, uh, you're not, well, you are in some sense the victim, but you're not fated to live in an ever more selfish, unequal society. They could have, um, that, that when I say they, I mean the progressives before, could have decided, well, it's, you know, we'll just float with the drift with history. But instead, they reached out in the words of one of them, not drift, but mastery. We want to change the way we're headed now. And therefore, um, I don't think we should now just say, well, eventually it'll turn around because America always turns around. I think we've got to, and especially young people, have got to actually act and one of the most encouraging things to me about the last 12 months is we have seen large numbers of American kids voting in unprecedented numbers and, and moving into the streets. I don't mean violently moving in the streets, but trying to rouse the rest of us out of our slumber. The upswing, how America came together a century ago and how we can do it again. And uh, I want to put all of our viewers out of their curious misery here by saying yes, Shailen Romney Garrett is the second cousin of the senator from Utah and former presidential candidate Mitt Romney. There. <laughs> and Robert D. Putnam has been our guest as well. They come to us from Utah and New Hampshire, and it's been an absolute delight to have both of you on our program tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank Steve. you. Hospitals stretch to their limits, resulting in what is often referred to as hallway medicine. Well, it was a major conversation in the last provincial election. And that's why it was a natural topic for tonight's premiere of the third season of the TVO original series, Political Blind Date. It airs right after this program on TVO and on our website, tvo.org. But now COVID-19 has magnified the situation as never before forcing the system to bend and adapt in ways that some didn't think possible. With us now on what's changed and what might be worth keeping post-pandemic, the two politicians featured in the episode, we welcome in Mississauga, Ontario, Natalia Kuzendova, a registered nurse and the PC member for Mississauga Centre, and in Brampton, Ontario, Sarah Singh, deputy leader of Ontario's official opposition and the NDP member for Brampton Centre. Also with us, Dr. Quam McKenzie, the CEO at the health policy nonprofit Wellesley Institute and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And in the downtown core of the provincial capital, Susie Hoda, infectious diseases specialist and hospital epidemiologist at the University Health Network. 
And I want to welcome the four of you to our program tonight. Just before we get going with our conversation, we thought it might be useful just to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. This term hallway medicine or hallway healthcare, what does it all mean? We have a handy little explainer. Sheldon, roll it if you would. What is hallway medicine? Hallway medicine describes a situation in which patients are placed in hospital beds in unconventional locations, such as hallways, that were not designed for this use. It occurs when there are more patients admitted to hospital than rooms available. Ontario is one of several provinces in Canada with a hallway medicine problem. Hallway medicine can mean patients receive care in locations that do not support rest and recovery. It can also cause increased stress on healthcare providers. A main cause of overcrowding is extended hospital stays of patients waiting for spots in long-term care homes or other alternative care facilities. Experts say that when it comes to the hallway medicine problem, expanding the number of long-term care facilities is a top priority. Jay and Jagannathan with that backgrounder. Okay, Susie Hoda, let me get you in here first. The issue of hallway health care has been around for many years. How different is it since the pandemic hit? Well, you know, as you've heard, it's not been uncommon in the last three years or so for us to see patients lined up in hallways and emergency departments or even up in inpatient wards in hospitals in Ontario. Um, and that was particularly bad when we'd hit respiratory virus season, where we'd see a little bit of a surge of patients. Now we've got on top of that additional volumes of patients that are coming into our emergency departments because of COVID and, um, you know, suspicion of COVID as well as confirmed diagnoses of COVID. And, you know, these patients end up being admitted to the hospital and having a longer length of stay than your typical medical patient that would be on those inpatient units. And 20% of them will end up going on to requiring ICU level care. So it's stressing the hospital system on multiple fronts, whether it's inpatient medicine, ICU care, but also when they're discharged, you know, having complications in the requirement for follow-up uh, in ambulatory settings as well. So lots of different um, additional stresses now faced by hospitals because of COVID on top of what we were already dealing with. Quam, maybe you could help us just understand why it exists in the numbers that it does. We heard in the background that, that a lack of adequate long-term care is one of the reasons why it's so bad. So let me ask the obvious question. Uh, why do we have so little long-term care? Well, I think our hospitals are full and struggling every winter because obviously they haven't got enough capacity. Uh, but also because too many people are getting sick. And 85% of what makes you sick is social. So that's housing policy, education policy, economic policy, human rights and policing. They all impact health. So if we want to sort out hallway medicine, we have to have better social policy uh, as well as better health spending. Uh, but it's an ounce of prevention that's worth uh, a ton of cure. So yes, I agree, we need more long-term care, uh, but we also need uh, to fund mental health better and social services. If we can keep people out of hospital, and if when people get ill, they get sick, they get uh, better quicker, uh, we decrease the pressure on hospitals. Uh, and so it's not just long-term care, there's more to it than that. Okay, let's get our two uh, stars of tonight's other show on into the conversation, if we can now, our two members of the Ontario Legislature. Uh, Natalia, let's start with you. You, uh, obviously, you're an elected member, but you were uh, an ER nurse before that, and uh, I think are, you're still pulling shifts uh, in the hospital as well during this pandemic, is that right? That's correct. Especially at the onset of the pandemic, uh, back in March, I started working uh, at my local hospital in the emergency room, uh, taking almost full-time hours at the beginning, at the onset of the pandemic. Now I work about once a week to help alleviate some of the pressures and some of the fatigue that is being experiences, experienced by the frontline workers at my local hospital. Okay. What role, Natalia, if any, did, did your seeing hallway medicine before you got into politics, have in your decision to get into politics? Well, Steve, actually, hallway nursing, as I like to call it, because it is truly the nurses that are taking care of patients 24-7, uh, that was my primary motivator for running uh, and for getting into politics. Because as a brand new nurse, when I started my career, I would often get the dreaded hallway shift. Because it is true, nurses like to eat their young, and it is uh, baptism by fire. So we do often get, as new nurses, the most challenging shifts. And what that meant for me as a new nurse, uh, Stephen, was working in a 
very narrow hallway, if you can imagine, and uh, having to take care of five or even six bedridden patients at a time with very limited resources, limited access to my peers and colleagues to ask for questions because I'm outside by myself in a hallway, and having to run inside of the uh, department to get every needle, every syringe, every single medication. So this was a very frustrating uh, and tiring experience for me as a new nurse. And often when I came home after 13 hours of working and not even being able to take a break, you know, uh, I, I had to really self-reflect and, and think to myself, is this truly the uh, the healthcare system that we are so proud of as Canadians? So I did a little bit of digging and uh, I looked into how we are funding uh, healthcare in Ontario. And it turns out we are funding it at almost 40 cents to every taxpayer dollar. And so uh, what I realized is that a lot of the monies were being spent on healthcare bureaucracy and uh, the money was not necessarily going down into the front lines where it is needed the most. And that truly motivated my uh, my ambition to run for politics and uh, and I have done so. And uh, of course I was very uh, lucky and privileged to, to get the mandate from the people of Mississauga Center. And I'm so proud to serve my community since. And you are in the midst of your first term as is Sarah Singh. And I wonder Sarah, how, how the hallway healthcare issue ended up on your radar screen to begin with. You know, for me, um, Steve, I was born and raised in Brampton, and our healthcare system in Brampton has been underfunded and neglected for decades. And growing up in that community, anytime my family or friends needed to, um, you know, visit our local hospital, uh, we would hear these horror stories or experience them ourselves of waiting in the hallway, receiving care in the hallway. Um, and, and for me, I, I thought that we deserved better. And that was one of the major factors that actually motivated me to consider uh, provincial politics was to help address what we knew was a chronic underfunding, um, a lack of political will to invest in our local community here in Brampton, uh, but to ensure that people got dignity and care as well. You know, it couldn't just be my family that was experiencing this. Like I said, it was so many others that I would hear from. Um, you know, they would go... Uh, to the emergency room, wait eight, nine, ten hours to receive care, um, often ending up in a hallway, um, you know, on a stretcher, uh, no privacy, um, not a direct access to, uh, you know, frontline staff as well. Um, and so we had to address this resourcing problem. And when we look at what's happening in Brampton, um, this is a community that is not receiving its fair share of provincial um, funding uh, to help build the capacity that we need. In fact, Brampton Civic was at over capacity the day that we opened. So these types of issues really resonated with me uh, as a local community member, but also as a grassroots organizer um, and activist uh, working on social policies. I was really motivated to help transform our system, but also advocate for our local community to get the resources that we need. In which case, Susie Hoda, let me try this. If we literally doubled health care spending overnight, would this problem go away tomorrow? Well, I mean, the money is, is going to help provide some of the resources, but, you know, there are a lot of other enablers that we need to have in place, you know, including having the trained staff to actually, um, you know, help with building capacity um, and, and other things that will help to make the system move more smoothly. So I, I think it's not just about the funding, it's about building the entire capacity required to help the system. Quam, can you follow up on that? Because oftentimes we hear, if only we had more money, if only we had more money, I'm also hearing now from Natalia that it's not just a question of how much we're spending, but how we're spending. True? Both are true. It is how much we're spending. It is how we spend it. So we can't get away from the fact that um, the province of Ontario uh, spends the second least of all provinces on health. And um, whether we talk about other things like bureaucracy or whatever, I mean, we, we still don't spend enough. You're talking about uh, per capita, I presume. Per, per capita, oh yeah, per capita, yes, obviously, yeah, we're a big province, so, but per capita, we don't, we don't spend that much on health, uh, and you get what you, what you pay for, uh, but yes, like anything in life, uh, you want to spend it in, in a smart way, and uh, one of the smart ways you can spend health money, and this is one of the things that's happened in the pandemic, is people have started realising if you go upstream, and you work on the social determinants of health, you get more for your money. So you don't, if you just build more and more hospital beds, uh, you, you don't necessarily sort out the problem. It's a bit like 
uh, building more lanes on the 401, you, you get more traffic. Um, you, you need to diversify and think about getting people out of their cars if you, if, if you don't just want a bigger traffic jam. Uh, and yes, you need more capacity in the hospitals. Yes, uh, as Susie said, you need all of the enablers. Uh, and yes, as Natalia said, you need uh, more and better nurses and better mm -hmm. Um, and better uh, staffing and processes. Uh, but all of that needs to go with good social policy because you need to keep people well. Uh, and so I think all of those things need to go together. Oh, in which case, Natalia, as you mm -hmm. pull those 13-hour shifts and you see what you see, um, give us some ideas. When, when you are in the midst of one of these long shifts as a registered nurse in an emergency department, Etobicoke General, I guess, is that your hospital? That's correct. That's the one? Okay, as you look around and you think to yourself, boy, if I was in charge, I'd be doing this different. What's one of those things you'd be doing differently? Well, Steve, I think it's important to note that we need to have a multi-pronged approach to address this uh, capacity issue that has obviously built up over decades. And I think it's really important to note that uh, our government has added a net new 3,100 new beds since March of 2020, including an announcement that we have made just yesterday of funding 500 new critical care beds uh, with help uh, at our partners at Mackenzie Health and the new Cordellucci Vaughan Hospital. And so, and some of these investments, of course, also uh, went to William Osler and Trillium Health Partners here in our community of Peel um, to help alleviate some of the pressures that uh, Sarah had mentioned when, when she spoke. Uh, but I think, uh, as I mentioned, this is a multi-pronged approach. So at the same time, as we're building capacity in our uh, uh, in our hospital system, we also need to build capacity with our, our long-term care system. Because Steve, our healthcare system is an ecosystem. And if there is an issue in one aspect of our healthcare system, such as long-term care, there is a domino effect that trickles down uh, and uh, ends up in the emergency room with hallway beds being filled. Uh, I think it's also important to know uh, mental health. As an emergency uh, room nurse, I often uh, see people in crisis who simply have nowhere else to go and end up in crisis in the emergency room. Uh, and so, so I think it is important that we are making new investments into mental health, including a new investment of $195 million to help our providers uh, transition their services online. But also, I think it's very important to know that for the first time in the history of Ontario, we have a minister uh, responsible at the cabinet table solely to advocate for mental health and addiction issues to all of his other cabinet colleagues. I'm talking, of course, about Minister Tabolo. And so as having that advocacy advocate uh, at that cabinet table is extremely important because mental health issues transcend all ministries, frankly. I think the uh, Premier's, uh, if I, I'll, I'll just say, and then we'll let Quam get in there, uh, the Premier's office would be thrilled that you reinforced all of the news of yesterday's announcements, so well done there. Um, Quam, just before I get you in, I feel an obligation to let Sarah respond to that because, because uh, I mean, clearly the NDP have, have made hallway medicine a big issue, and in fact, even before you got elected, they were focusing on Peel Region and Brampton in particular. So even in, even in light of yesterday's announcements from the current Ontario government, how would the NDP be doing things differently if it were in power? I think that's a great question, and, and I think it, um, you know, really points to the need to address some of those social determinants of health. Um, as Kwame uh, pointed out very aptly, you know, this is what's contributing to um, some of the issues that we have uh, around people's health and the need to access health care um, services. So we would certainly be investing um, in all of those upstream supports that are needed, uh, whether that's housing, whether that's mental health services, whether that's our long-term care. So it's not just about a physical location in a hospital, which should be the last resort for folks. Um, you know, we would also be ensuring that that capacity is being built uh, within our healthcare system by investing adequately in it. Um, you know, the healthcare investments have not kept up with the rate of inflation. And when you look at a community like Brampton, uh, who has been so neglected for so many years, um, we are still receiving um, 0 0.96 beds per 1,000 residents when the provincial average is well above 2.10 uh, uh, beds per 1,000 residents. So that chronic under funding and that neglect needs to be addressed and and that starts by making those concrete investments to ensure those resources are also there for the community and that capacity is built but again it's as natalia pointed out an ecosystem so all those other systems also need to be taken into consideration so that 
we can ensure that people are healthy in our communities um, and that there are those underlying root problems that are contributing to their health concerns are being addressed as well. Um, and those are promises new Democrats have made. Things like pharmacare, things like dental care. These are investments that help keep people healthy, um, help them address uh, some of the uh, concerns that they have with their health, um, but do it in a proactive way to ensure that those investments are targeted and actually reaching the people that they need to. Okay, Quam, forgive me, I interrupted you. You wanted to say. Well, I, um, it's always great being be between the two politicians because <laughs> um, uh, uh, we, we hear the political rhetoric, and uh, but I'm really interested in the people. And um, just to give you a few statistics just to show the, pen the uh, pernicious nature of austerity. So in the UK, they actually did uh, a calculation of the impacts of austerity on health. And they looked at preventable deaths between 2012 and 2017. And they found that there were 130,000 preventable deaths that occurred because of austerity. And that was social policy, that was housing policy, uh, that was not supporting people properly in long-term care. All of those things that studied to death and literally studied to death. Uh, and uh, it's very clear the impact. Uh, so notwithstanding the fact that everybody is grateful, and I'm very grateful for uh, the focus on mental health and uh, the focus on increasing capacity uh, during the pandemic, uh, the truth is it's probably not enough. Uh, we probably need more, and we probably need significantly more if we are going to be as proud of our health service as we should and as proud of our social services as we should be. Um, the figures are startling. And um, as we've seen government more and more led by numbers and figures, I, I'd really like to square the circle on the size of the problem and the size of the investments that people are talking about. Uh, because so much more needs to be done. Okay, let me follow up with uh, Susie Hoda on that, because some things have changed since the pandemic has hit. And I gather from your perch at University Health Network, which is a network of hospitals, not only do you have a good sense of what's going on there, but presumably beyond as well. How are hospitals since the pandemic hit working together better to try to deal with many of the issues that we've been talking about here so far? I think one of the best things that's come out is that we're working more as a system. Um, and so, you know, early on in the spring, as long-term care homes were running into major issues with outbreaks of COVID-19, hospitals came in to help with infection control and with managing the outbreaks. And, you know, I think it really has resulted in some benefit in terms of um, really uncovering some of the infection control um, opportunities for improvement. And I think we'll end up in a better place with long-term care now that we have these partnerships in place between hospitals and long-term care. But beyond that, there have been other partnerships. We've been working much more collaboratively with public health for rollout of vaccine and other initiatives related to the pandemic, um, as well as amongst hospitals themselves. So, uh, you know, it, it's been quite um, disparate from one area to another, even within the GTA, for example, as to how COVID has impacted hospitals. And some hospitals have been absolutely overwhelmed, Peel Region, Scarborough. Um, and there was really early on a need <coughs> to identify to try and help with load sharing and provide some equitable access to care across the system, as well as make sure that you're not going to get into a situation in any of those hospitals where safety can be compromised because of the sheer volumes of patients that were coming in. And so hospitals with Within the GTA have been um, transferring patients around in order to keep the system moving and functioning safely. And I think that that, while it's you know a crisis intervention and may not carry on um, outside of the need of you know a pandemic or a crisis situation, there's definitely some benefits to having that kind of a system in place if we ever need to have um, you know that kind of uh, load sharing again. So definitely lots of lots of examples of how the system's been working differently to actually improve our, our ability to cope with the pandemic. Let me get Sarah's sense of that as well. I know obviously you've been fighting for Brampton's quote unquote fair share, but having said that, do you see more collaboration among the healthcare partners to make things better during this pandemic? 
Absolutely. I think there's a huge opportunity for that collaboration and to have these conversations about innovation that can be uh, brought about within our healthcare system. You know, we think about our long term care system. There's also the opportunity to focus on community care and community centered care for seniors. Um, so I think that there's a, a lot of innovation that's uh, come about as a result of the pandemic. And hopefully there, there are ways that we can continue to make sure that coordination is happening. So folks are getting uh, better uh, supports and, and more wraparound care as they need to. Um, but that's also going to require investments to help make sure that, that those supports can continue and that the system can integrate itself the way that we've seen it, it do within uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, as Susie pointed out, um, this is a crisis intervention measure right now. And, and hopefully it does continue because there are a lot of positive things that are happening um, with that coordination uh, in our healthcare system between the hospitals and our long-term care, for example. Well, let, let me do a quick follow-up with you there. Um, Sarah, I think we're spending almost $70 billion a year on health care. How much do we need to spend? You know, I think we need to uh, spend a lot more than that. Obviously, that hasn't kept up with inflation over the years, and this isn't just a new problem. I think if, if we could double that number, uh, we might be starting to actually get somewhere with um, the investments that are needed across the province, not just in my community of Brampton. So I would encourage us to think critically about uh, how those investments are being made and, and where they're being allocated, but I think we should be doubling that number. Doubling? If we could, yes. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing Natalia laughing. How come you're laughing, Natalia? So, I mean, um, just to make, just to be clear, uh, this year we are spending 2.5 billion more on hospitals than in previous years. So, this this is a net 13 percent increase uh, in the hospital budgets, which is well above. Uh, which is well above the rate of inflation. And uh, sorry that I laughed about the, the doubling, but, you know, uh, that's almost the entire Ontario budget. So, you know, as government, we have to prioritize uh, money where money is needed. And the, uh, obviously, we are in the middle of a crisis, and it is not a time for austerity measures. And that's why at the government of Ontario, we have allocated $30 billion to, uh, to fight COVID-19. But on the ground, you know, I wanted to talk about some of this breakdown of the silos that, that have been mentioned. And on the ground, I have seen this, uh, and it has been such a positive experience. For example, at Etobicoke General Hospital, we have opened up a, a, a COVID-19 unit within the old emergency room, where we were actually transferring patients in from long-term care uh, to help offload some of those pressures on long-term care homes, which were having problems coping and challenges with staff. And so I myself have worked in such a COVID-19 unit, taking care of COVID-19 patients from long-term care to help alleviate some of the stresses being experienced there. But another area which is uh, an innovative uh, and interesting area of investment for our government is uh, the paramedicine program, which we have announced, I believe, several months ago, uh, which is very meaningful, especially in more remote and rural areas, which will allow paramedics to work directly with some seniors um, and uh, residents to actually uh, allow them to stay at home longer without needing long-term care. So we are meaningful uh, in our investments, uh, and we're, we're trying to put the money where it can make the biggest impact. Also, we have updated, you know, the physician billing codes to allow for telemedicine to occur. Um, and it has, the update ha has been great. I know we had some physicians on your show last week, Dr. Jennifer Kwong, who has been talking about the fact that she is now seeing 50% of her patients via telemedicine. And so these are some positive changes. And I believe those changes uh, are here to stay. Let me do a follow-up with Quam on the long-term care aspect of that. We have seen that the current government of Ontario has put some hospitals in charge of some long-term care homes where there have been COVID outbreaks in those long-term care homes and the province has lost confidence in those homes' ability uh, to, to run their affairs appropriately. What do you think about the advisability of putting hospitals in charge of long-term care homes? I think that um, one of the things that everybody said and I agree with is that we've moved from, is this your job or is this my job to let's get the job done? And um, I think it depends on the hospital, it depends on the long-term care, and it depends on the circumstances. Um, and uh, I think you have to take um, each uh, situation on its merit. Um, and I, I know of hospitals who already run long-term care homes, and uh, this is an expansion of something they've already done, and there are other hospitals that this would be new business. Uh, so I, I think it depends. I think it's difficult to produce a blanket 
um, response to that because it does depend on the situation. Uh, but Can I just get Susie on that? Just before you go on, Quim, I wouldn't mind Susie on that because, I mean, one of the reasons I ask is hospitals are being asked to do darn near everything these days. I mean, never mind. Uh, well, I don't have to make a list. You all know what the list is. They're being asked to do far more than they ever were in the past and now run long-term care homes on top of that in the midst of a global pandemic, a once-in-a-century phenomenon. What do you think about the advisability of asking them to do that, Susie? I think the partnership has a lot of benefits. I would definitely support that aspect of it. Um, as long as we're resourced to do it and, uh, you know, that's part of the plan, then I, I think it's it has some very, very big benefits. But it really does come down to the resourcing uh, because we're all very stretched, as you've mentioned. Okay. Quam, you wanted to say? Oh, I was just saying that um, I think that when we're talking about the benefits of things that have happened during the pandemic, I do really like the idea is it, that um, the health service is now working more like a system, and that's what it should be. I do think um, it's also um, worth noting that um, the fact that we've got more data-driven and more transparency in the way that things are, the decisions are being made and advice is being published is really important and those news conferences. But I also think that we're now starting to collect sociodemographic data and try to use it to prioritize communities uh, and also to develop services. And I think that is an innovation that we really need to bottle and keep uh, after the pandemic uh, because we've been running blind for uh, a long period of time because we haven't had the right data on the social factors that are so important for us to have a joined up health and social services system and to have a joined up policy. We've just got a few minutes left here and I'd like to give the time uh, equally to our two politicians here and, um, and focus on this. Uh, just in a few minutes' time, immediately after this program's over, you two are going to be the stars of Political Blind Date, which essentially is a program that tries to get two politicians of differing views, often in differing parties, to basically, um, well, walk a mile in each other's shoes and, and just see, try to see the issue from the other person's point of view. Um, Sarah, come on in first on this. Uh, we are surrounded these days by so much toxicity and mindless stupid partisanship. And I have to say how nice it was to see you two respectfully listen to each other's points of view. Do you think it's possible to transform politics so we get more of that and less of the stuff we don't like? Uh, I can't say we can transform politics, but I suppose we can each just start with trying to do our best to work across the aisle. I think, you know, as uh, Natalia and I discussed, there are good ideas on both sides of the aisle. And if we are not going to discuss those ideas and, and have conversations about that, we aren't going to find some middle ground. Um, and I, I think that that's possible. And I hope that that spirit of collaboration continues. Um, but uh, it's not always easy because I think when you look at some of the impacts that uh, perhaps conservative cuts might be uh, causing in our communities, it's hard to want to work across the aisle and support those types of initiatives. Um, but I'm hopeful that hopefully we've created a space for dialogue and, uh, and, and that's something that we can continue to do moving forward. Now, when you say conservative cuts, Dems fight in words for Natalia. So I got to give her equal time <laughs> on that. Natalia, uh, I, I have to say, you know, I, uh, I'm sure people who watch the program are going to be rather impressed about how well you two got along and how well you were prepared to listen to the other's point of view. Obviously, you're coming from different ideological places, but do you think it's possible to get some of the toxicity out of politics and have just a little more civility? Is it doable? Absolutely, Steve. And I think the silver lining in this entire pandemic uh, was how well different levels of government with differing ideologies have worked together. As you know, uh, our Premier Doug Ford and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and uh, Deputy Prime Minister Krisha Freeland uh, uh, talk to each other very often, even uh, to the point where uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland called uh, uh, Premier Doug Ford uh, her therapist. And so I think uh, it's very important to see that ongoing level of uh, collaboration among uh, different levels of government, but across uh, partisan lines as well. And, you know, I like to say that there is no monopoly on a good idea. And so even when, uh, you know, members of uh, opposite bring uh, forward ideas uh, that are helpful and, and that uh, are uh, benefiting the people of Ontario, I think uh, definitely uh, they should be considered. And there is that space 
space uh, for dialogue. And I was just so thrilled to have this experience with Sarah and get to know her a little bit better because, you know, we are very uniquely positioned as two young women in politics uh, to be role models and to be leaders in our community. And so to have each other's support and we are the center ladies, you know, uh, it's been a, a quite enlightening and, and very positive experience for me. You say the center ladies because that's Natalia Kuzendova representing Mississauga Center, Sarah Singh representing Brampton Center, and thanks as well to Quam McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute and Susie Hoda from the University Health Network. Great having all of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. And to the two MPPs, you really should stick around because I think you're going to enjoy the show. I sure did. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. Tomorrow, we're looking back at five years that have passed since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report to find out what, if any, progress has been made. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. We'll see you again tomorrow. Now, stay tuned for the season premiere of Political Blind Date, coming right up on TVO.